So how to structure a manuscript? Uh, all of you, I'm sure most of you like movies and good stories, poetry, etc. So one thing that is common between all these forms of expression is a thread between beginning, middle and end. Yeah? You don't like a movie which doesn't have an end. You don't like a movie which doesn't have a beginning. Right? And it all has to be cohesive. It cannot be independent ends. Beginning cannot be different, end cannot be different. You know, somehow it has to come around at the end of the day. And then you would say that was a memorable poem, that I liked it, that I did not. But the author did the job of presenting it to you well. Yeah? You like it or not, the author is good. That's the way your paper should be written. Yeah? You have got your methodology selected as we did. You got your literature review. You got your you did your tests, you did your analysis, yeah, you have your results. Now you have to put it in the form of communication. You cannot uh, put them distinct from each other, you have to relate. So let's see how we go about. So there is uh, something called the Imrad model. It's nothing but introduction, methods, results, and uh, discussion. That the core of any paper should contain these four elements. Yeah? You need to have an introduction to your paper. You need to say what methods you have used. Because what we discussed before the break was that your methodology decides on what kind of a journal you use, and it also shows how good your research is, and it, is, if it can stand the peer review process, etc. So if you have to tell what methods you have used, what are the results, are their results good enough, are they significant enough to be published, etc., and what did you find new? But sporadic results are never putting the whole story together, because you are the storyteller. You can't expect the reader to understand your story without putting it together at the end. So you should actually put a discussion of your results. What does actually your analysis mean to what you introduce the topic for? Yeah. <laughs> that is the core of any paper. So while writing it, do not forget these four sections. Yeah? And all the items around them are basically, I would call, uh, the marketing items. Yeah, the title which is clear and searchable in the internet and interesting to the editor. So say, ah, oh, um, that's a great title. You know what it's about. Abstract is where you put in concise 100 words, this is what the paper is about. This is why it should be interesting. Again, a marketing element. And then you've got keywords. That is purely a technological element which actually helps the editor to search using your keywords who are the probable reviewers. Yeah, there are 1,000 probable reviewers, reviewers for your paper, but then your keywords. And then at the end we have to wrap up the references because research without citations is not research. Yeah, because you have to tell the community I have read what happened until now in this area, what has been found, I have read the methodology, etc. etc. from these people, they have developed that, you have to cite all of them. You cannot say I have read somebody and not cite them. You have to cite them, that also shows respect to your own colleagues saying that, hey, you did a good job, I cite you here, because it was helpful for my study of what you found. And then, of course, the acknowledgments for your lab assistant to help you set up the experiment for your funding agency, very important, that they give you money to set up that. So they are all marketing elements, okay? yeah? So, so the right order, so, Mm, can somebody tell me, so from our previous slide, uh, what should you write first? Anybody? Well, Just I throw it. Title. Title, okay. And? Title. You say no. Abstract. Abstract. The last one. In abstract, I heard. So you see already in this small group, okay, there is uh, a different understanding of how you should write a paper, right? Uh, each of you has your own model, but as you, you say, there's always, you're always coming back to the title to change it because you wrote something else later on, so why would you start with the title? Yeah? So the right order, and uh, of course it depends on you what you're comfortable with, this is the ideal order, is first, 
your methods and results. Data, methods, and results. You write that section first. Your main headache is over. Because you're like, I have done so much on this data set, you know, I have to write it all down. So I can't come with the title first. Later, write, write down all your methods and results and while doing the research itself. So while your analysis is running, you can actually write down about the method you are using. Unless if you want to change the method afterwards. And then comes the introduction and discussion. Because from the methods and results, you have found something to give to the audience and that leads to uh, actually putting this element of what you are giving to the audience and which is an introduction. You see? And the discussion around those methods and results. Yeah? And here there's a nice point right after selecting your target journal. As I said before, every journal has an aims and scope. Every journal has a different area of publication they are interested in. Every journal has a target audience. And you have to match your target audience, your aim, your uh, uh, analysis and methodology to that journal, and then write the introduction and discussion. So to a theory journal, you can't write, this paper is about an empirical analysis of this data. Yeah? Because then you have to put it in a theory way. This analysis proves a new way to understand this theory. You know, so you can't exactly start a paper completely with induction. Always methods and methods. And then, write at last. Because, as every good storyteller knows, you write your story completely and then you come to your title. Right? And it gives you also creative freedom. Because your logical side has finished the first two. And now you're free. You know, you're like, okay, I've written them down, I have completed these two main parts of my paper which are the deciders that uh, I'll be published. And now let me work on the marketing parts. Try to announce that. Yeah? I have a nice example here. <coughs> that was my first draft title of the Corruption and Innovation paper. An analysis of corruption and its good and bad effects on types of innovation with special application to African countries using the multi-dimensional methodology. <laughs> that is too long. Yeah? has too many keywords, it doesn't work as a title, it's a paragraph. The title should never be a paragraph. So what, what did I make? Sorry? It's a medieval title. It's a medieval title and it shows some kind of insecurity in there. Yeah? It says, hey, I did this and then did this, you know. So I won't tell it in the title itself. So I changed it to Effects of Corruption on Innovation in Africa. Yeah? As everything up there, a multi-dimensional analysis. I made sure because my paper was methodologically different from other papers in the field, I made sure that it's in the title. Because the editors, I go there, if I had only written Effects of Corruption on Innovation in Africa, it's like, okay, yet another paper on corruption in Africa. What should I look forward to? That's the main marketing element. And then I had a multi-dimensional analysis. Because before that, nobody had done that. Yeah? And then the, the editors or reviewers would say, oh, that's interesting. Now. Let's see, let's see this paper. <laughs> and shorter and easier to understand. So, and that comes, such kind of uh, understanding comes. This happened because I chose the title first methodology. Yeah? Because I was like, oh, title, yeah, title. This, and this happened, title last. Because I was free in thinking what my paper is about, what have I written, what is the methodology I'm pushing forward here, and then come to the proper title. So think about that, think about that at the end of writing, you are free of mind also. Abstract. I would say this is the killer, this is the killer set, really. Most reviewers who get a paper to review, or even journal editors, they don't have time to read your paper because, in the first instance, because they have many others waiting in line for the review, yeah? So, you have to make a very first impression with a good title and then a very good abstract. Yeah, it has to be concise, it has to be standalone, which means that if an abstract is there, it should be able to tell what is this study about, why is it uh, new, methodology or in theory, and then what are the results. Three main things, that's it. Because that will decide if any reviewer is more interested in your paper or less interested in your paper. So be very careful in designing the abstract. Every journal 
provides you in the journal's author instructions how long the abstract should be. Some journals might ask you to give a 300 extended abstract, and in that they would say already uh, what an extended abstract should contain. Yeah? And then some journals say, give us a 100 word abstract. So abstract writing is very, uh, it should be a practice. It should be a practice. You will come up with many drafts of abstract, but finally, at the end of the day, you will find one good one, which you say, yeah, that gives the message. But there are uh, there are there are uh, pointers also which can help you. So it should be brief. Yeah? State the objectives of the study. Why? The question of why. Yeah? Describe the methods employed. But we don't want detail. We don't want I collected data from this sample using this. Nothing like that. Just every method has a name, like multi-dimensional analysis or uh, random sampling, etc. So use that and use those keywords which might be attractive. And then summarize the results, not more than two or three lines. Because if the result is interesting, the interest in your paper will go forward and they will see your detailed results anyway. But what are those results that pop out of your paper? That's very important to be clear. And then the principal conclusions. You know, not, not, not minor conclusions that uh, this variable affects this variable, that variable affects this variable. But what is your conclusion? Yeah? Carrots have been found to be contain uh, toxic elements in, so in such a sample size of, a, uh, of this region, for example. That, that's, a, that's a result which uh, people would like to see how you have done it. Yeah? Trace principal conclusions. And avoid abbreviations. We don't want abbreviations which people don't know. And even if you say United Nations Organization, it's good to expand them. It's good to expand them because on technical side, the publishers will use all those as search engine terms. Yeah. So you want your abstract to be discoverable on Google. And then avoid references. An abstract should never have references unless it is specifically targeting the paper. Yeah, as I said, in editorial commentaries, etc. Avoid references. You don't need a reference in the abstract. Just say this is a study about this is what we used and this is what we found. And as I said, now coming to the main elements of IMRAD: introduction, methodology, results, and discussion. Introduction. Each of these IMRADs should have in themselves a beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah. So I have seen introductions so badly written that I don't want to read further after one page because they are just too getting into details already. You know, you want to you want to draw the audience into the topic. You know, but you have been reading the, the literature for a long time, but the audience is not. So you have to actually introduce uh, why this field is interesting. What has been happening in this field? What are the main questions? So do not write a comprehensive literature review. For that, you have a literature review section, yeah? But write uh, so that people can read it and find out this is the topic about this has been found, the concise information. And then the middle of the introduction should be about, okay, you brought in the topic, yes, we agree it's important, now what do you do, yeah? Simple sentences saying that in this paper, we took sample of this with this and use this methodology to study this and not detailed results again. We found a positive correlation between this fact and that. No. Introduction should be much more gentle and much more uh, <coughs> professional saying that our study shows or uh, suggests that there is this relation between these two. You know? And then you have, you have got the reader's interest in going to the next step. That's the end where you bring in the reader's interest. Again, you have to write the aims of the study and then the methods you will use. So we are going to use the future events, yeah, to show that. Yeah? And <clears throat> you should not, as I said, age-old research, citing that is good, but it should not be the only research you should cite. State of the art, new literature. You know, that shows also you have been reading, you have been talking to the community. And then you have to use those citations in the introduction. 
in a, in a appropriate manner, either in the methodology or in the uh, general discussion of the introducing the uh, topic itself. So you have to check if these three, that's a checklist for you for the introduction, beginning, middle and end. And now we come to the methodology in the IMRAD model, methodology. Um, you know your methodology well. That does not mean the other person would also know it as well as you. You know every minor detail, but you've got to repeat those details sometimes. You know? Why is this methodology needed for this particular study? Who has said that? I can't decide by myself, yeah, this is needed, but I have to cite those sources. This person used this methodology to support this, and this person used this methodology, but we find that uh, due to our quality of data, due to our uh, uh, aims, you know, we, this methodology is suited. And you have to give uh, actually a sufficient argument on why you use a certain methodology. Yeah? And then that's why established methods can be referenced. You should do that because if you are using already an established method, then you are free of discussion why you are using such methods. Right? It's an established method, don't need to go into nitty gritty. But if you are establishing your own method, that itself becomes a paper. It's a totally different paper, you are a methodological scientist, so in that sense, the entire paper will be about methodology that you develop. And you have to describe every statistical test that you have used, which actually supports your results, or tries to establish the validity of your data or your questionnaires you used to your in social sciences. Because what might be minor to you is not actually minor element. It is necessary. Uh, I, I remember one of my review uh, papers which got, I got by contribution. I only added one small statistical test which I had already done. And that changed the entire fate of the paper. Because that made many things clear for the reader. Okay, this is why he's using that, this is why uh, uh, you can't use this method, but I'm trying to tell, you know. So don't uh, leave out minor elements. If it is too minor, the reviewers will tell you it's too minor, get rid of it, you don't need to present in a paper. But put it in. And then the results. Here's where your talent comes in, in uh, communicating. As I said, uh, you've got to communicate at the end to your target audience. That's where your storytelling uh, talent comes in. First are methodological results, purely like this has been, this, uh, this is a correlation to that, that is a correlation to this, etc. But at the end of the day, you want to present results as scientific results, saying that this has been shown on. You know, it's not about uh, discussing. You cannot judge that, you cannot judge your results right there, saying that this is the best result we have got, etc. So just state them. And then do not duplicate data amount, so that's, that's the main point actually. So if you're already uh, showing uh, a figure containing a result, you, know, you don't need to repeat that in a table and again talk about it. So you're only repeating the same result and showing as if you have found a lot. Yeah? So keep to it. If you have discussed the figure, don't discuss it anymore unless it's really needed to reference afterwards. If you, have discussed, if you have put uh, a table, then you don't need to put a figure again with the same data. You have to choose what is more representable. And it's very important to include this. Uh, I have seen papers which come with a lot of tables and nobody explains to me what is happening there. Yeah, I have to look through tables like that. So there's a lot of statistical analysis going on. Everything is there. I don't know. As a reviewer, really, do I want to sit and make sense of your paper? Not my job. You have to communicate it with me. You have, you have to communicate it to, to me. Which means that you have to actually write down in words what your statistical tests are showing. How does it support your uh, methodology in, 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 and also the other tables and figures in context. So put some effort into that in explaining each statistical test that you have done and what it actually helps you improve it. And as everybody I think knows, figures are the best way to communicate your results. Sometimes you can't communicate with tables, for example, but you can use pie charts. 
Yeah? Because then the reader gets immediately an idea. Oh, well, this is what he's trying to say, this is what she's trying to say. And keep it really simple. The table should be simple, not too many details in it, not too many uh, points. What are the main? In fact, I've seen papers where uh, authors provide in the appendices all the detailed tables, but in the main paper, the results that are specific to the paper itself. Yeah, what are interesting. So that's a nice style of uh, presenting the paper. Yes. And again, avoid duplication with text, because what is in table is already told in the text, what the reader needs is what you make out of it. And then it's very important to label your figures. You can't put a pie chart and forget labeling it. What is it about? And also, when you label it, you've got to reference it in the text. Saying that figure one shows that, you know? And figure, we have shown in figure one this relation, etc., etc. And then, it's very important as, uh, I, a good example is Franz's presentation today regarding all these data sets that are moving up and down. He has shown a nice trend bar going up. Yeah? In terms of points. So it's very good to actually learn how to chart things. Even a subject like history, you can chart things. You can really put it in figures and you know different methods. So uh, there are very good books on Amazon and, and many publishers are publishing these books on how to make charts. How to make charts. And it will help you in your own teaching. It will help you in your own teaching career. It will help you in expressing yourself well. So, uh, put some uh, time into uh, making interesting charts and trying to make sense out of them. And legends should be standalone, which means that every figure should have its own legend. You can't say, I have put the legend in the first figure, it's the same. <laughs> you can't make it. Proper chart making, every picture should have its legend. Because people forget what that color was in the second page and they have to keep going back and forth. And it's just a painful task to review. Uh, yeah, this is a very good example. Now, this analysis wanted to show that they did the same experiment in north, east, and uh, vertical uh, parameters. So it's good actually to put all of them together because the audience can compare directly. Yeah, but this cannot be in page uh, ten. This cannot be in page 12 and this in 15 because it's just uh, not intuitive enough to put together. So put them all in one page, yeah, and then good practice, figure, you yeah? know, and then you got an explanation. Some journals also also tell you how long should the explanation be. I know that, for example, the Journal of Financial Economics wants one full paragraph explanation. But the Journal of Financial Econometrics wants only one sentence. So read author instructions. Read author instructions and make it. Uh, and for example, here they have also labeled what is red, what is black, so that people can realize what it was. Yeah, that's what we have talked about. And then the end. So you're like, yeah, you're a great scientist, you know the method which I don't know, you have talked about the topic, now tell me what I can make out of it. Because most of the people, really, the reviewers also, especially in uh, social sciences and humanities, they first read the abstract introduction and discussion. Because that raises interest in saying that, okay, this, is, this makes sense, let me now read into how he or she has found it out. So it's very important to design your end very nicely. Yeah? And of course, this is the most difficult section. Imagine you have to put it all in three or four pages. All that you have been talking of in the last 15 to 20 pages. It is difficult, you will come up with many drafts, etc. But a clue is in your introduction. You introduce the reader to a certain necessity of studying this topic and to the current state of research on it. There are the clues where you have to come back to. Yeah? So, do not repeat the results again. The results are in your research section, but make sense of them. And connect them to what the difficulties and topics you raised in the introduction. So it's a complete circle. Yeah? And 
because in the introduction we said in, we should put future tense, saying that in the paper we are going to show that. In the introduction it should be we have shown that, or our results suggest that. <coughs> so it's again a complete circle. Again, be humble. <laughs> you are doing research. Yeah, it's not like this is my result. This is the final truth. Be humble about it. This is the one you know. For example, if somebody says our findings prove that, it means it's the final word, right? And in science, there is no final word. Our findings show that. That's also in between the final word. Our findings suggest like. Therefore, the government should be doing this, or therefore, the history should be interpreted this way. So you've got to really conclude the paper that way. And again, the middle of the introduction, one paragraph per idea, which you have raised in, that, in the discussion. Sorry. And what does it imply? And then move to the next one. And then move to the next one. So in that way, you can actually make it really uh, concise in what you are discussing. And then, it's very important. You know why? Because you might actually find support from other research who also have found the same result from their countries or from their analysis, saying that this result actually has been also found by them yeah, in that context, which means my result actually uh, uh, strengthens the argument that this particular phenomenon happens. And then you have to compare it. Yeah? And maybe you're asking, also <coughs> deliberating, maybe this is why my result is like this. This is why my result is not like this. And then you have, uh, you have to really say this was ambiguous <coughs> in that study. You have to really put forward the problem there. Yeah? Your study is also not perfect, but the other studies are also not perfect. You have to say, this is a problem, but you know what? We are trying to push it forward. and. Our results actually try to solve those problems, and this, this, this particular result helps in that. And of course, those are the Eureka findings, saying that okay, we didn't expect this to happen, yeah, but don't already give a theoretical uh, answer to it that yeah, of course we expected this to happen. Yeah, it was really unexpected. So state as this is something new that we have found. We still have to deliberate or future research has to still deliberate on why this might be happening. Yeah. And then again, write down clearly what are the limitations of your study. You know what your limitations are. There's no shame in writing down. Because by saying by doing that you avoid one uh, possibility of a rejection also. You, know, you should never put a paper like this is the final word. Every paper has its own limitations. An idea of how that limitations could be data. You could say, unfortunately, this study would have used uh, panel data, but due to uh, uh, our data uh, structure and uh, the sample size, we could not collect it. That would be part for future research. It's like telling the scientists, guys, I know this is wrong. Now come up with new questions because they will surely, they will surely do that. Yeah, and that will become again an, an exercise in answering their questions. <coughs> and the end will be again reiterate your conclusions. What are your conclusions? You know, in summary, we want to say that. In conclusion, we want to say that. Or our results suggest that. And then applications. <coughs> this this particular technology can be applied in this particular industry uh, after some years or. But produced on a large scale, it's a little bit on future work. It just it just makes the paper look really professional. Yeah? Maybe you don't have an idea about what future work could be, but you could be a little bit creative, I think, a little bit uh, of opening up of the research. And then come references. Very important, do not forget any references. Do not forget citing any useful references. Do not forget uh, taking content and not, uh, so do not forget that if you take content and not cite them, you will be in problems. Okay? But you have read so much in your reading phase, which I have been telling, read, read, read. How would you manage all that? What you have read and how would you pull out papers which can be true, uh, which can be suitable for your paper? So the, the best part is softwares like papers, reference work, EndNote, and Mendeley. 
And this is a Springer product. Yeah. Uh, and basically what these softwares do is that when you download a paper, etc., they are already taking that paper and they extract all the keywords of the paper. The so next time you have a collection of 100 papers in your computer and you want to see uh, what is, which is the paper discussing about uh, Africa and innovation. And then immediately the software shows three different papers in your collection showing that. Mendeley is uh, throughout the internet. Yeah? So they are internet based and there are reference management softwares. Now what these can also do is every journal has its own way of uh, citing and referencing uh, work. So American Psychological Association has one way and then you have uh, uh, math has a different way of the citation and the referencing style. So softwares like EndNote and Papers if you tell them, you can connect them with your Word, Word program in which your paper is writing or LaTeX, etc. And then just give a command, I want for this journal. And most of the software already know which journal wants, or which publisher wants which kind of citation style, and it will automatically generate all that. So all you need to therefore do is cite. Make sure you cite, because building, earlier days in 90s, it used to take days, if not months, to just build your citation list. Yeah, to make sure if I miss something, to make sure everything is properly cited, all brackets are there in every paper, but still you do a mistake. So these are, you don't need to worry, you have all these softwares, you know, and if you're using LaTeX, uh, it's free, it's open source, and uh, in that you, you can use BigTech as a management reference management software, and then you're done. So, open to questions. I just uh, said to your colleagues that you can ask me questions in your language, whichever you prefer, and somebody can translate, and you can translate, and then we do that. Because the language should not be a problem in asking questions. <coughs> Anything up to now in structuring your paper. Because after this, I'm going to move into a totally different topic. We want to come back to it. <laughs> because once you submit a paper to a journal, you cannot submit parallelly to another journal. It's against publication ethics. So which means that you have to make sure that you follow all the norms of submission. Any questions? Okay. So before you yeah, before you hit the giant submit button. <laughs> Uh, if you are working on a collaborative paper, yeah, you cannot work alone and say, now I have finished the paper, I will submit it myself. You have to get the consent of your co-authors, work with them together and then decide if you are to go through and work with It is very important you get all the agreement from all co-authors. And then you got to prepare a cover letter for the journal editor. You can't just say that, okay, this is the program in the general website, I've just submitted it. But at the end of the day, it's not the machine which is uh, reading your paper. It's the person who is getting it. In olden times, before the electronic submission started, uh, one had to send six printed copies back to back. Six printed copies and a cover letter to the journal editor in a packet. Yeah? And those printed copies should be completely typeset, formatted, everything. So, one part of that which is still inherited is the cover letter. Yes, you have to really communicate to the editor why my study is important, why, what is this uh, paper about. And as I showed in the website, read the uh, guidelines for the journal very carefully. So that you don't spend the time just submitting and then the journal says, hey, but you missed this point which we want from your paper. Yeah? So read author instructions regardless of any publisher you are choosing. Everybody will put an author's instructions and follow them and repeat them. And Never submit your paper to more than one journal. This has been a frequent problem with people who want to publish quickly. That they think, 
oh, I'll throw all the stones at once, yeah, and one one of them will hit, yeah. But that's not ethical. That is not uh, good towards your reviewers, etc. The main practice is send to one first, yeah, because they are spending time on it. They are spending money on it. They will review it, and once you get the result, you can actually use that result to build your paper further, and then send it to somebody else. Now that's why it takes more than six months sometimes. If you send to a, to a journal, it took three months to review, came back, reject, sorry, you go to another one. That's the process, and that's why research cannot be linear. You can't say, after I publish this, I will start working on the other. You have to overlap your research projects so that your second research project doesn't get affected by the delay in the publishing of the first one. So, And then we've got cover letters. I'll give you a short introduction to cover letters. Yeah? Uh, because cover letter is the one which the editors like to read. They like to read, and then they will read in the abstract, etc. Because they want to see what exactly the, um, the author is trying to say. Maybe you know the editor already. Who knows? Maybe you have met her or him in a conference. And then the editor says, ah, this is that paper from this person. Nice. I thought she writes to me now about the paper. And a cover letter should not also be like this. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I'm sending you a manuscript title. We would like to have a manuscript considered for publication. Of course, that's why you're sending it. Yeah. And please let me know if you're decision at your earlier community. It's like it's like here's my resignation and tell me something, you know, that's it. That's Remember, the other side is a researcher too. Yeah, this cover letter works has no effect on the editor's uh, uh, interest, which means you have lost one point of marketing yourself. Yeah, you got to actually expand, expand the letter at least to one full page. Yeah? It's not two pages. I have written three page letters also. You know? Because this is where you sell your manuscript to the editor. Now you are a salesperson. So all this time you were doing research and managing things, finance aspects, resources. Now you are a salesperson. So yeah, you got to sell your manuscript to the EIC, who is the first one to see it. And then, you know, one of my journal editors receives about 12 to 15 manuscripts every day. Every day of the year. Yeah? He doesn't even take Christmas <coughs> holidays sometimes. Yeah? Which means that you can't just uh, ignore that that person is putting time in reading your cover letter. You're right, you're very And address the EIC personally, not like to the editors in chief. The journal website already writes who is the editor in chief. To Professor, for, for, to, to Professor Letton. Yeah. And then give the background to your research. Yeah, this is the background to my research, and that's why I did it. So it's like concisely putting everything your paper says about not thinking of the abstract actually and putting it in the same way. And then why does suit the journal? Because people will ask, okay, it's like it's like finding jobs. If you go to job interview, the first thing that a clever HR manager asks is, why did you apply to my company? Why do you want to work with us? You can't say because you're Google. Yeah, you have to really give, yeah, this is my talent, this is my paper, this this is your journal. We have a match here. Yeah? And then take away points. My paper, our paper, suggests that blah blah. Point one, point two, point three. So that the editor sees, ah, these are some interesting points. So that you don't distract the editor with other details, and the editor thinks, yeah, this is nothing of a paper. Now reject it. And you can actually recommend reviewers. Do you know that? You don't need to think that you can't recommend reviewers. If you know an expert in your subject. You can actually say, possible reviewers could be these, these, these people. But it should not be from your university, of course. Yeah? If you show that you are active in the community and you are helping out the editor-in-chief in choosing reviewers. The editor-in-chief need not take your suggestions, but has an idea of what kind of people he or she wants. And if you have conflict of interest, for example, if your paper is conflicting with another author's paper. You don't want that author to get this paper for review. Who wants to 
encourage a paper that throws down his own work. Right? So you can say, my paper has stark contrast to this person's research, so I request you not to send to this person for his review in the context of his work. You can be absolutely open about it. I did that once because we had funding issues with the, uh, with the uh, organization and there was a professor who was politically acting against our institution. And we had written that for this project, we had funding issues with this institution. They didn't explicitly support us. So we would be happy if we could exclude this particular reviewer from reviewing that article. Because it's fair. We don't want any conflict of interest, political or financial, to affect the judgment on our research, right? But you've got to give the reason. You can't give, I don't like him. <laughs> you have to give the reason. Because at the end of the day, the EIC is free to decide even to send to that person. And there's no legal jurisdiction here that you can sue the EIC, why did you send? It's only courtesy and professionalism that counts. And then, uh, I want to go back. Uh, an important part is, as myself, I'm not a native English speaker, you know, I don't have Oxford English and uh, neither of uh, us are very uh, fluent in English. So what is necessary is that we, do, we should not make language a barrier for communicating our great research results. Yeah? Because at the end of the day, your result counts. Yeah? So don't make a language, la language to be a barrier to that. So, Make sure that you take help of professional services. There are native language translators everywhere. In fact, many universities, maybe the academy also here, I'm not sure, they do uh, funding support also. They say, here is a paper, I have written in English. Uh, I want to get it proofread by a native language speaker, and they do fund your uh, proofreading, etc. Yeah? And because if a professional editor sees your manuscript, you will really raise the quality of it. I have done so often, I used to send my paper to America, because our institution had a freelancer working, and she would send me back in a weekend the paper, and the paper would look like, she would ask us, so what do you mean about this, can you put this this way? And then the end result would be completely different, which does look as if I have written the paper, with my language abilities. Yeah? And one of them, for example, is our partner Edens, yeah, they, they are professional language uh, editors and generally if you plan to submit your journal, if you remember I showed the journal website, on the right side it shows language editing, you get a discount on, the, on, on their prices, but you are free to use your local resources, there are many I'm sure in Moldova also uh, who, who are uh, native language speakers and you can ask them to check them and then for example, Nature Publishing Group has its own language editing resource. There are guidelines how to write an introduction, how to write, and even Springer of Rome has such guidelines, I'll show you later. And then American Journal Experts, so experts also, so it gives a lot of online. In online, there's a lot of help. In fact, there are books called How to Write for Journals. You know, very small books, very nicely written ones, what kind of terms to use, what kind of terms not to use. But at the same time, as I said, reading will help you there too. If you read good papers in your field, you already know how to write it and what kind of language they use. All that remains is cosmetic changes which a language editor can help you do. And then here are some resources. Uh, we have, uh, for example, uh, Finger Exemplar and Google Scholar where you can actually use uh, how many times you are using the word, which is not used often. Purdue University Online Writing Lab is free. Go there, take their online course, you know, work, uh, use their resources because uh, they help you a lot. And you have to follow the instructions of the target journal. So sometimes they would tell you write in American English or British English. It's very important. And then you've got your own uh, Microsoft or uh, your own uh, native word processing program which actually can uh, see what kind of errors you have done and use, use all the functions possible to make sure your language is clear. And word count is necessary because, as I said, we have three types of journals, letters, professional, reviews, and then fourth type professional journal, uh, practice journal. Um, each of them has a word limit. It will be given in author instructions. If they say 
no more than uh, 20,000 words, they mean no more than 20,000 words. You can't say, I'll submit a 40,000 word manuscript and then I will decide if they accept or reduce it. Because it's a, it's, a, it's a bad sign, which means you didn't read the instructions of a journal when you're submitting it. So they say no more than 20,000, make the paper 20,000, or better 18,000 words. Because once the reviews come in, you have to add some things, etc. Because the journal has its own page budget issues, and because at the end of the day they are publishing. Yeah, so they can't just have one paper which is 60 pages in the journal, and another with 10 pages, it doesn't look good. There should be some kind of consistency. And then spell check. Be very careful because sometimes uh, you replace words in a wrong context. Uh, don't depend completely on the program saying find all and replace all of these. Year and year, for example, it's difficult. And then of course you can use online glossaries and dictionaries to make uh, So put put good amount of time in uh, giving a good makeup to your paper in terms of language and presentation. Then comes the biggest thing, and this has been in discussion since last 10 years a lot, publication ethics. Even some government ministers had to give up their PhDs because they were found to be plagiarizing content. Yeah? People are, internet is open, everybody is reviewing your papers, everybody knows where you were where uh, you would have taken content from, everybody knows where your content is taken. If somebody has copied your paper, they know all that. So, the, uh, and then online tools are coming up to check. Yeah, if you're a reviewer or something, if an editor has a doubt, this sounds like something else which I read before. They can give it to cross-check, you know, it's a platform, and then cross-check tries to find out where are these sentences taken from without citing. So you take, I had a case where uh, a complete government report, government report was copied and pasted into this person's article. Yeah? And then when we checked, we found the government report original and it was not cited here. It was, and it was a clear case of plagiarizing content. And in another form, we found the paper actually being abused by other people. Yeah? Our paper, for example. Yeah? So in that sense, it's very important to know your local publication ethics. First, what does your institute say, or what does your department say? Second, overall scientific community's publication ethics. And do you have all the permissions? Suppose you need an image. You need an image from a certain website or something, if you're doing sociological work, uh, an image of a, a person with a, a, with a deformity or something. You can't just copy it from Google Images and put it in your paper because that is copyrighted content. You need to get permissions for everything that does not belong to you. You have to write to people saying, I want to use this paper, can I have a permission? Or if it's already published content, you have to write to the publisher asking, I want to take this table from this particular research paper and use it in my paper. And only if you have the permissions, then go ahead with that. If you do not have permissions, you better not keep it. Because end effect, you know, even if your paper gets published, it will get retracted, which is an insult, and it ends your career completely in research at least. There, was, there is a person from Netherlands. He had 51 retractions. 51 papers. He was a star also in psychology. You know, for 10 years, he ruled everywhere. Everywhere he was a speaker because his papers were getting published. He had like 60 papers getting published yeah, in five years. Nobody knew how he made it. And then, since the last three years, he's going to court every day. Because he has been found 51 times duplicating his results, duplicating his data, making the same result sound new and publishing it in another form. And he has no career anymore. Yeah, his integrity is questioned everywhere. So don't, don't even uh, indirectly get into that. Very important that people who you collaborate with also know that point that you are having particular ethic there. So <clears throat> generally what uh, research papers like in Lancet they have found is what kind of uh, scientific misconduct is uh, most uh, repeated, uh, like is, is most, um, uh, most dangerous here. So minor is undeclared conflict of interest. 
which means that um, you have done a result, but it might be affected to this particular party, and you did not declare it. That's a minor point. Generally, people come and say you have to put it in, yeah, or um, somebody was in your project already before. They took part in it, then they said, I don't want to be in this paper anymore. But then later on they can come and say, I participated in this too. So that's a minor uh, conflict of interest, which borders with um, dispute <coughs> ownership. So this one can be more serious also. People have had cases where uh, generally research is in pure sciences, for example, in, uh, it spreads around years. And a person who participated in year one of this research didn't participate anymore, but then has actually equal right for the publication which came in. Yeah? So they can say, look, I was also part of this project, or uh, I was part of this version of the paper, but then they removed me. It all comes to us uh, publishers and the journal editors to solve. But still, these are manageable. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Even my slides don't like plagiarism. <laughs> I don't know what's that. Okay. Do I have Yeah. <coughs> yeah, they're going fast. No problem. Any questions? You can take this time to ask the questions. or even blogs. Remember, if, if, if somebody has written in a blog something and you use the same statement, it is still copyrighted content. You cannot just use it. Yeah? That's pure negativity. And then you've got uh, duplicate publications, like just changing the introduction, changing the results a little, but using the same data set and analysis and showing it as a... That has been the biggest all reasons to now, all in, all interactions since the last seven, seven to eight years. The people, because of this publish and perish paradigm, they are so desperate to publish because they want to get funding or something. They try to, they think, oh, there are a million papers, if I manipulate this, it won't be checked. But at this point also, there are websites and blogs completely de dedicated to finding plagiarism. So don't think uh, that if somebody copies your content, don't think that they will go uh, free. Somebody's going to find. At the same time, don't think that if you take some content, and even if you forgot, really, honestly, sometimes you forget citing things. Yeah? But at the end of the day, before submission, you've got to check if everything is cited, if everything is quoted well. And then that's the data fabrication. So there have been cases where data itself has been manipulated to suit the results. Yeah, there was a professor in marketing in my university in Europe who just added one more star to his results. Just like when you report statistical significance in a result, generally the more stars you have, the more accuracy the result has. Stars means probability levels. Although his results had one star probability, he conveniently added type two more stars there. <laughs> and and he basically manipulated the results. And if he couldn't do that, he would manipulate the data set. He would enter his own numbers to the real data set which he collected in the market. Yeah? But that people find, because that's very easy to find. If you say you have collected this data, people will collect again the same data and see that your result was wrong. And if it was wrong with your own uh, methodology, you have cooked up something. That's it, you know? And that's the most serious of mistakes, actually. And that can end, forget it, you can forget research. So, there are some resources which are there to help you as researchers to also see if what kind of help you might take from other researchers. One is COPE, Committee on Publication Ethics. 
which actually tell, gives you all the best practices and cases. What should I do when this happens? What should I do when this happens? You know, what if, what if I find my paper plagiarized by another? What are the next steps? This website gives you everything. It gives you case studies. It gives you also best practices. It gives you also government updates, saying that from now onwards, this is also considered plagiarism. So this one should be a bookmark in your website, in your computer, because anytime you want any question, even, you know what, how many of you are teachers here? How many of you teach? Not many. But you might be dealing with students or whatnot, their papers, etc. And if somebody plagiarizes from Wikipedia as their assignment, you know, <laughs> all these resources are helpful. Yeah? Uh, and there are currently 5,200 members like you, researchers, administrators, who are part of that uh, committee. So, short overview of what happens in peer review once you submit your paper. Yeah? The general decision, general editor decision is final. Yeah? You can contest it, but given reasons. Uh, there are basically a complete rejection, uh, this nothing, you know, or saying that we need major revisions in this paper. Without major revisions means if you don't revise that, you can't accept it. Yeah? And then minor revisions, saying that there are typos in your paper, or can you please give this correlation table, etc. You know? And once you do that, you are through. And then acceptance. Yeah? It takes time, effort, nerves, you know, you really get stressed answering these uh, revision letters, etc. And that's where I'm here. So, general reasons for rejection from reviewers or editors are you didn't state what you want to find or what you claimed. Yeah? You just put the results on the face of the paper, but you didn't state anything for presentation matters. And you didn't answer the hypothesis. You didn't answer your research question at all. Yeah? So why should I, well, how does this paper stand as a research paper? And then contradiction within the manuscript. First you said in the first paragraph that it's good for the economy and in the end you proved it bad. <laughs> you should be spinning. <laughs> you should be able to have a consistent thing. And then rambling discussion. It's just going on and on and on, talking, you know, it's like, Come on, what's your point? Tell us that. Don't waste your time. You're only doing this because you have nothing to show. That's what people say. Inconsistent use of terms. Serious, because that shows you don't read anything. And conclusion that is not supported by data. So although your data shows that uh, number of women working actually uh, leads to uh, good learning results for children, and then you conclude that we need to increase the number of men working in schools. Yeah, where is your conclusion, where is your data going? So such inconsistencies are generally the reason for rejection. And so, but at the end of the day, okay, let it run. At the end of the day, uh, there is a simple, uh, okay. I want to show a nice chart to you. There is a simple thing in the minds of every reviewer. Even if when you are a reviewer yourself, or a journal, you got to do this. You have to have fine balance between the novelty and significance of research, how new is it and how important is it, okay? And the aims and scope of the journal and the impact of the journal. That's a thing which comes by experience, you know? Because sometimes, if this is more and this is less, yeah, we are basically publishing not so new results in impact factor journals, which will actually kill the journal. But if, it, if this becomes more and this less, you are only doing political games here. You are only doing a uh, publication for getting impact factor, suiting the aims and scope. So never be in this imbalance. Try to balance it of what the journal can benefit from, what are the angels for, and with the novelty and significance of it. Yeah? At the end of the day, you need people to read your paper. So, 
These are all the points which I, as a reviewer, also used in my decisions, and generally it's used by everybody. It's good to note them when you are also asked to judge a paper, not just in a journal. A student writes a manuscript for your uh, what not assignment or something, a master's student or whatnot. Use this criteria. Use this criteria because you get to practice this. So, is are the definition. So, is everything clear? Is it defined, objective, <coughs> and rationale? Is there enough background? Because that shows that okay, this has some weight in the study. You know, uh, this is very important. Can somebody tell why reproducibility of results is important? Anybody? Why is it important to, for any other researcher to reproduce the same result? certain trend is confirmed or not. Exactly. To comparing data. To comparing data. Exactly. That is the thing. Exactly. And, and so... Culture by culture. Right, right. So you would know, that's what Socrates actually started, the trend. He said, you got to repeat it until you come to one answer. Yeah? And there is, there are two ways of repeating. One, if I'm not able to repeat your results, Either I did something wrong or you did something wrong. Okay, both are beneficial, but you should not create a data set or a method which nobody understands and doesn't do. Yeah? Moon landing, for example. Yeah? Have we reproduced the experiment of moon landing yet? Difficult, right? Trillions of dollars required, corporate interests required, etc. So that experiment has that experiment has not been confirmed yet. That's why people always spin conspiracy theories around that. So it's very important that you create your results and methodology so that people can cross-check. Can cross-check if the same tendency is found in their data, and if not, why? Yeah? So reproducibility is very important. And then, of course, the experiment results. Are they described in the context of what you're talking about? Are the limitations discussed? Nobody wants to have a paper that says, I have the final word on this. Yeah? Maybe it should be discussed. And are these conclusions supported by other research? So what all we talked about on writing the introduction, uh, methodology, results, and discussion, the reviewer is going to see the same points. Have you supported the conclusions with other research? Have you given limitations? Are your results, uh, are your findings described in the context in which you wrote the paper? Is the literature cited appropriate? Publication ethics, everything comes in. Are there contradictions within the market? If you do not have all these, then you have a good chance of getting published. Yeah? <coughs> and then, now, second stage. Now the reviewer is like, okay, I'm happy, but the paper needs to do this. Uh, the paper is not clear on this, etc. So they write to you back questions. They write back to you questions, and generally our response is anger. They're angry. They're angry that that person never understood what I meant. They are angry that that person contradicted what I was. Doesn't he understand? I have written this in my text. Yeah. So put the anger aside. Be objective. If he or she has not understood that point, it means you didn't communicate it. So, you are in the business of storytelling. You need to uh, communicate. So, again, polite. Politely respond. Not right. You are an idiot, you don't know about this area. <laughs> you know? Don't do that. Yeah. Make it easy to see the changes you have done in the manuscript to suit what the reviewer wanted and refer to line and page numbers in answering the reviewers. In page number 23 and line 13, as you mentioned, we discussed this topic again, and we clarified this, yeah? And always mark changes in different color or font, so that the reviewer can immediately see, ah, now she has applied, okay, fine. She has discussed this paper. Sometimes reviewers give you also very good uh, suggestions on papers. They would say, this study would benefit if uh, this paper is uh, read and cited. So you have got a paper to read and you can use it. 
the way it is uh, supposed to be used and highlight the text where you have changed. And it often happens, experimental economics or any experimental study, they would say, uh, try to do one more round of testing. Are you aware of medical tests? Yeah? So I say try to do one more round, get that data through and analyze, we have some doubts. Answer, do it. Simple. Do it because they have all reasons to ask you that question. You can't say, I don't have time, keep it, take it or leave it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, they're not in a bargain for you, you know. They have proper reason why are they asking you to repeat the experiment. Uh, and then, that's very, that, that, that is a tactic in communication skills. That when you are when you when you really think the reviewer has it wrong, you can't say you have it all wrong, Mister. Yeah, you have, you have to put it in a professional way, saying that this is this is why we think this way. Yeah, and therefore your reasoning does not apply. And comply with deadlines. Very very important. When a review comes, when a revision comes back to you, it comes with a date. Please send it within two months. Send it within one month. Yeah, it's a good thing. You won't, you won't believe how long people wait for the revisions to come. I have a, I have a paper in uh, one of my journals in which the author is revising the paper since 2011. Three years the author is revising the paper. And sure, they are going to reject that. Because if, if you ask you to revise it, why did you take two years to rewrite the paper? just doesn't show any professionalism or something really is wrong with your analysis. And you have to really so address all reviewer points individually. So they generally send you a Word document with the questions of reviewers. Answer every question. Don't ignore one question because you don't have an answer to it. Then you are inviting the reviewer to reject your paper. Answer it. And if you say, yes, you are right, we did not include that, but due to time pressures, we are not able to run the experiment again, write it. If the reviewer thinks, well, that's okay, if you will process with it, fine. But that's life. So, uh, that's a nice example here. So, the reviewer had commented, in your analysis, you have chosen to use a somewhat obscure fitting function. In my opinion, a simpler Gaussian function would have sufficed. Moreover, the results would be more instructive and easier to compare. So very useful points are there. Yeah? The, generally, uh, people, what they do is that uh, they ignore the point where you, you give the credit to the reviewer that thank you for noting this. Yeah? So we agree with the reviewer's assessment of the analysis. Yeah, it's true, we could have used a simpler function. But then you write why you did not. But then you say we have redone the analysis using the Gaussian fitting function. So here you find it. But we like our analysis too. So in that sense, you are not confronting saying that we totally disagree with the reviewer that the Gaussian function comes. Just do it and let's see what happens. And then a complete disagreement with the reviewer. Very you have to play it really politically right and diplomatically right. We agree, it would facilitate. However, our Taylor function allows for analysis in terms of Smith model. Now see, they say our methodology is supported by research. So we are sticking to it. Good way to tell it. But we have added two sentences to the paper to explain the use of this function and the Smith model. And that means that, okay, fine, you guys don't agree with me, but then you want to support that research, so let's go ahead. Uh, there are some points when the reviewer has it right and you need to clarify that, yeah? So, the original answer to a review was, when we, fit, we then fit the data to a super Gaussian, from this we extracted the reaction time. That was the response. But a better response would have been, we then fit the data to super Gaussian. We elected to use this function to facilitate us. So why exactly did we use the Smith model? Would be better. Okay, and then so what was shown, and then using this model we extracted the data. Because then you explain to the reviewer 
well reviewed because the reviewer uh, needs more information most of the time, which you didn't provide. Maybe he's just, uh, he or she is just uh, confused on what you're saying there. So you might clarify. So here is a checklist for all of you for general acceptance. Design your study appropriately. Comply with ethics guidelines. Show new results and interesting results. Nobody wants to see that you have replicated the same study and found the same result. Good for you, but not for research. And then correct statistical tests should be used, appropriate ones in the right manner to use them. The writing should be good because at the end of the day, your paper lives longer than you do. Yeah? So you don't want some PhD student in 2080 to access your paper in some sci-fi uh, database and say, look at the poor English this person has written from 2013. You know? So do, do a good presentation. And then you have to explain the significance of your findings. You have to choose the appropriate chart of the journal or else you will keep getting disappointed with rejections because you just never care to see what they want. And then comply with the archive to others. These are all this is a checklist that you really need to keep all the time with you. So is there any energy patience or you want to go home? Because I have some I have some slides on the impact factor and open access. What should we do? I want to stress you all because there's a lot of information, yeah. Do you want to know about how to measure impact of their papers? No? <laughs> well, right, yeah, exactly. We started also a bit later. Yeah, but I, I need questions now. I will not leave you before I get questions. <laughs> but we have talked so many things about so many aspects. Certainly, uh, you, you would have had some questions which I didn't answer. As I said, you can ask in your local language and somebody knowing English can translate. Too tired for questions, right? No problem. Let's have the evening for us then. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for keeping up with the, with the workshop. And I hope you all uh, a good research career, publication career. And anytime you have questions, you have my cards. So please feel free to contact me. Yeah? And go home and have a nice coffee or tea, what all you drink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.